Hi, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, wherever you be. I am Professor Lucy John from UT Austin and Editor-in-Chief of IEEE Micro. 2021 marks the 50th anniversary of the microprocessor. This milestone actually coincides with the 50th anniversary of other iconic companies such as Walt Disney World, Starbucks, Amtrak, and the first flight of Southwest Airlines. Incidentally, microprocessors have had their impact on all these companies and beyond. As Editor-in-Chief of IEEE Micro, I would like to welcome all of you to the release event of the November-December 2021 issue of IEEE Micro that celebrates the 50th birthday of the microprocessor. We have articles from major participants in the microprocessor story, Intel, AMD, ARM, IBM, NVIDIA, Centaur, Cerebras, Motorola, Texas Instruments, and more. This is a celebration. Many pioneers and industry leaders are here. Let me welcome all of you, Pat Gelsinger, Intel CEO, Federico Fagin, designer of the first microprocessor Intel 4004, IEEE Computer Society President, Forrest Schull, many other industry leaders, all of the article authors who are here, and all of you, readers, fans, friends, and colleagues. Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger will be presented with the official release copy in a few minutes by IEEE Computer Society President Forrest Schall. Microprocessors have been a passionate topic for designers and users alike. Discussions on microprocessors can get heated just like religion and politics. Many of us remember the risk cisc wars. I thoroughly enjoyed various microprocessor projects in different stages of my life, whether it be an x86 compiler for the fourth programming language as my senior design project, or MIP simulation and pixie-based instruction set analysis during graduate school, or various architecture research projects as a professor. In this special issue, there are approximately 30 articles. Many of the authors are here and they will speak to you later in this event. Industry leaders and designers and readers were asked to reflect on their favorite microprocessor or their favorite microprocessor memory or the coolest feature in a microprocessor and many sent articles. When you go through this issue, you can read what AMD CEO Lisa Su's favorite processor is. NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang writes that the coolest feature in a microprocessor is the peripheral bus, a memory mapped IO feature. AMD CTO Mark Papermaster will speak to us later about his memories from AMD and previously IBM. Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger, Simon Segar ARM CEO, Mark Liu TSMC President, and all send us reflections which are printed in the issue. John Hennessy has written an article characterizing the first 50 years as five distinct eras. Unfortunately, John couldn't join today. It is my privilege and honor to present this fantastic issue to our readers. But first, let me introduce Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger, our special guest today to receive the official release copy. Pat Gelsinger started at Intel in California in 1979, way before microprocessor was even a teenager. He was the architect of the Intel 486. He became the first CTO of Intel in 2001. He worked for 30 years in Intel before leaving to EMC in 2009 as president and chief operating officer. 
He served as CEO of VMware from 2012 until returning to Intel in 2021, just a few months ago as CEO. I guess just in time to celebrate this 50th anniversary of the Intel 4004 chip. Gelsinger has written a book about Intel 386. He received a master's degree in engineering from Stanford. He is an IEEE fellow. My first memory personally of Gelsinger was reading this debate between Gelsinger and his professor John Hennessy in the microprocessor report published in the 90s. Gelsinger represented x86 and Intel and debated with his professor Hennessy who represented MIPS and RISC. Pat, it is my honor and privilege to have you here. It is a pleasure for IEEE and IEEE Micro to present you a copy of the special issue to you, which will be presented to you by the IEEE Computer Society President, Dr. Forrest Schull, in a few minutes. Dr. Forrest Schull is the 2021 IEEE Computer Society President and the lead for Defense Software Acquisition Policy Research at the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. Forrest, the floor is yours. I invite you to make your remarks and present a copy to Pat Gelsinger. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be able to be here today because I think this is a particularly uh, auspicious uh, milestone in many occasions. So as many of you may know, this, is, this year is also the 75th anniversary of the Computer Society. Uh, and so you know, after decades of being at the forefront, you know, across the, the, the waterfront, as it were, in the computing field, uh, it's really nice that we're able to share our birthday with the 50th anniversary of the microprocessor as well, uh, and to be able to reference this, this other historical milestone uh, that's so important to our profession. Uh, when I looked at the, uh, at the this issue of IEEE Micro, I was really struck by the diversity of perspectives uh, that was there. And so I really enjoyed reading what was there, but also understanding that this came from people, you know, the, the content that was there came from people with so many different backgrounds, uh, authors that were around the world, um, authors who were not only from academia, but also from industry. And so the, as Dr. John already mentioned, that, that kind of rich perspective brought from a number of CEOs and CTOs, I think made the content so, uh, so immediate and so important uh, and so, so, so much of a pleasure to read. I think that this issue of IEEE Micro kind of showcases the computer society at, at its best, you know, doing what it does best, which is bringing together uh, technical leaders from across our broad field uh, so that we can share and all understand the, the contributions that have been made in so many different ways. Uh, before I present you with the, the virtual copy, I do also want to say that my volunteer history with the Computer Society, I came up as an editor-in-chief of one of our other magazines. Uh, and so I know how much effort it really takes to bring something like this together and to bring that, that diversity of perspectives all together in one place. So I, I want to make sure I take this opportunity to say thank you to Dr. John and her editorial board and to our staff and to all the people that contributed the time and effort to bring this really historic milestone uh, together and to have this journal here in front of us today. So I really appreciate all that effort and all your good work for the Computer Society. But with that, I would really like to, uh, to say again, thank you to Mr. Gelsinger. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Uh, it's a shame that I can only do this virtually, but I'm very happy to present you with our uh, released copy of the journal. And with that, let, let me turn things over to you for your remarks. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you. And, uh, you know, I do think of this as just a very special moment. Happy 50th to the 4004 microchip. You know, and, you know, if you think about all the things that have been possible over the last half a century, you know, it's just, you know, as I think about it, it's almost a sacred moment. Uh, in uh, technology and, you know, the collection of individuals here, many I've worked with, many I've competed with over the years, you know, this is just fun. Uh, and it really is, an, uh, you know, a, a tremendous honor, you know, for me to be accepting this on behalf of the Intel Corporation, the IEEE, but really the industry. 
And, uh, you know, now as the uh, eighth CEO for uh, Intel Corporation, you know, it's not lost on me the amount of effort and work that it takes to get the publication done, but all the chips that we're, you know, reflecting in this uh, 50th anniversary. You know, and, you know, as we think about it, you know, everything in the world today is going more digital and everything digital runs on semiconductors. Our role in society and this rapid pace of tech evolution is accelerating and rapid fire and moving more quickly than ever before. You know, in fact, when I submitted my quote for the uh, this uh, edition, you know, it's already out of date, right? You know, I, you know, you know do you mind if we go update it and reprint uh, that we've, you know, since the early 4004 at four bits at 740 uh, kilohertz, you know, we're now in our 12th generation microprocessor in our uh, core uh, family and 16 cores, 24 threads, 5.2 gigahertz. You know, this pace of technology is moving faster than ever before. And we do see that the role that it's playing in every aspect of human existence. And I would just ask all of us, what aspect of our lives is not becoming more digital, right? Everything, how we, you know, play, how we learn, how we work, you know, how we care for each other. You know, this industry is becoming central to every aspect of humanity. And we continue since the founding of Silicon and uh, Silicon Valley and as Intel, the company that puts Silicon into Silicon Valley in many uh, respects, you know, we continue to be on this job, this journey of defying physics over and over and over uh, again. As uh, the author Thomas Friedman said, the world is fast fused and deep and we're moving at a faster pace than ever, right? As we see the global capabilities and innovation increasingly uh, come together. You know, everyone and everything is becoming interconnected and computing is penetrating more and more aspects of humanity. And we're, you know, introducing new capabilities like AI that are making sense of it all and bringing new values as a result. You know, personally, as I like to say, you know, I, I went through puberty at Intel. I started there so young and uh, I grew up at the feet of Grove, Moore and Noyce, these icons of the industry. And, uh, you know, it was a frightening and exhilarating experience to be the architect of the 486 and the day to be the CEO of Intel. And, you know, bringing the 486 into production, this was a industry shaping, but also a career defining moment for me personally. And, uh, you know, my faith in technology is unwavering. You know, we have the opportunity to improve the lives of every human on the planet. And that conviction has only grown stronger as we see the permeation of technology into more and more aspect of our lives. You know, I'm also happy to declare Moore's Law alive and well. You know, we're bringing our first 100 billion transistor chip to market next year. And uh, Moore's Law, we believe, is on a healthy path for the next decade, which means by the end of the decade, we'll be delivering the first trillion transistor chip or multi-chip, if I'd be a bit more accurate. Moore's Law, alive and well. We're going to bend the curve even faster than we have in the past. We're in the business of exhausting the periodic table. And until it's done, we're not finished with Moore's Law. And, uh, you know, here we are at the golden anniversary of the microprocessor, but we remain on a relentless path to continue this magical innovation that truly has changed the lives of every human on the planet. And we're gonna keep doing it over and over and over again. We will together, this industry, based on this invention, create world-changing technologies that continue to improve the life of every human on the planet. It's an honor and a privilege to join you all today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pat, for your thoughtful remarks. And let's give an applause, virtual or real, to Pat. And special thanks to you from IEEE Micro for gracing this occasion. Now, joining us today is our very special guest, Federico Fagin, designer of the Intel 4004 chip that we are celebrating today. Fagin started his career in Italy and then moved to California in 1968. He was at Fairchild and then at Intel 
where he designed the first microprocessor, the 4004 chip. He was founder and CEO of Zilog and then Synaptics. He was awarded the National Medal of Technology and Innovation by President Obama in 2009. He recently published his autobiography titled Silicon, and I have a copy of the book signed by him, which, is, which I consider as a big honor. And in this book, he describes many of the interesting stories around the time the first microprocessor was designed. Federico, we are ready to hear your remarks. Well, finally, I got the mute off. Sorry about this. <laughs> Thank you, Lizzie, for your introduction. Uh, I joined uh, Intel uh, in April of 1970 uh, as the leader of the 4004 design. And uh, at that time, uh, my main motivation was to show the world that the silicon gate technology was second to none. I had been, uh, I developed that technology in 1968 at Fairchild Semiconductor. And uh, I was convinced that that was the way to go for the future. Uh, uh, however, the design of random logic required in those days for two phase random logic required to have bootstrap loads and uh, bootstrap loads could not be made with silicon gate, apparently, according to many. Uh, and so I racked my brain to figure out how to do that uh, because Fairchild had not adopted the silicon gate yet. Uh, and so a few months before joining Intel, I figured it out. And now I was ready for the challenge. Uh, finally, we could make, uh, I could make random logic with silicon gate, the first time that complex random logic was done with silicon gate. And I developed the methodology and I ended up uh, having the chip working in early 1971. At that time, then we had a chip that was uh, half the size of a similar uh, uh, logic chip made with metal gate. And it had uh, five times the speed for the same power dissipation. So it was a major, major accomplishment that set the microprocessor on a good path. And so from there, uh, I went on to design the other microprocessors of, of Intel as head of the small machine group at, at Intel, uh, including the 8080. And then I decided that it was time for me to move on because I felt that Intel was not moving fast enough in microprocessor in those years. And I started Zilog. Well, looking back, the uh, incredible, incredible uh, uh, progress that has been made in technology uh, and, in, uh, and in architecture and in the way to integrate all kinds of functions has stunned me. And so I'm looking, I'm looking uh, at a world that has been changed by the many inventions that have occurred both in technology and in architecture. So uh, looking ahead, I see however, two major important steps that need to be accomplished. One is to reduce the power dissipation and to reduce the energy required for, uh, for doing any kind of computation. If we look at our brain, the brain uses at least 1 million times less energy than we use for computation. So nature has done much better than we have done so far. So we have a long ways to go to reduce the power dissipation per computation for any type of computation. The other problem that I see is secure communication and secure computing, which is another major task in front of us. But I'm sure that the creativity uh, that will be, that will be uh, unleashed with this new technology that we have today, which is incredible, will find its match and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, years, 50 more years of incredible progress in the microprocessor. Thank you, Lizzie, for, uh, for setting up this wonderful uh, celebration. I'm really honored and humbled by it. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Federico. For me, it was a pleasure to get to know you more with the ISCA event and this event. And I enjoyed your book and thank you for being here today. Um, at this point, we will, uh, Mark Papermaster, AMD CTO, he sent us some, he sent us a video. He couldn't be here today because he is traveling at this time, but let us watch the remarks from paper master who talks about some of his memories. The Zen microprocessor journey at AMD is an incredible story. AMD really relied on a rebirth of microprocessor competitiveness as part of the underpinnings of the turnaround of the company. The AMD Zen microprocessor team put together an aggressive plan, a very detailed high level design that set out to achieve a 40% instruction per clock improvement in a single generation. In fact, they achieved 52%. And more than that, it was a multi-generational roadmap with strong improvements for Zen 2, Zen 3, and we have leapfrog teams. So we keep that momentum with the multi-generational design approach going forward. What a phenomenal uh, experience and just uh, great to see that type of impact to the industry. The other uh, very special memory I have is the IBM PowerPC 601, where I joined other leaders across IBM, Apple, Motorola, and went to a nondescript building where we were uh, put in and uh, told we were on a special project to start a new microprocessor family. And in fact, the PowerPC 601 was put together definitionally in a matter of days and brought to market in one year. What an esprit de corps to take on that kind of task, to tap a previous architecture work with a power and real single chip, bring on the Motorola bus architecture and get a new microprocessor uh, with uh, also Apple specifics all in the period of one year. All right. For 50 years, the microprocessor has been a key driver of innovation for semiconductor technologies. With billions shipped, microprocessors have touched the lives of almost everybody on this planet. Since our founding in 1987, TSMC's vision was to democratize semiconductor innovations through our pure play foundry business model. Today, TSMC delivers an effective integration of the world's most advanced semiconductor and 3DIC advanced packaging technology along with unmatched manufacturing scale, enabling customer design ecosystems, produces a variety of advanced microprocessors that better the lives of billions on this planet. We look forward to the next 50 years of microprocessor and the semiconductor innovations. Thank you, Mark Liu. President of TSMC and Mark Papermaster, CTO of AMD, for sending their remarks. Now we move to the segment with the authors of various articles. First, let's listen to Randy Steck, who architected Intel processors in the 90s. Well, I don't know if uh, you can say that I architected Intel microprocessors. I certainly had a lot to do with the uh, commentary or the uh, development of many of them. Um, I'd just like to read a couple paragraphs from the paper I submitted. From its birth with four bits, first tumbling eight bit steps, no longer an adolescent 16 bit design and well past the awkward 32 bit stage, the microprocessor is finally mature and well into middle age. It's only those of us who, for whom the fogey factor is high who remember this life cycle. It's certainly not been boring or lacking drama. Rem remember fondly the milli vanilli of semiconductors, the overhyped risk versus CISC wars, and our first experience with flame wars on comp.arc. Not to be missed is the history of brainiacs and speed de demons with special guest star Fireball. If you're confused by any of these terms, you've missed out on one of history's most fascinating stories. The crazy idea that started it all was TI's desire to put more than one transistor on a piece of silicon. 
The last 50 years hosted the largest explosion of technology in human history, driven by visionaries and engineers who repeatedly signed up to do things that had never been done before and which few thought possible. That, I think, summarizes how I view this, the world, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Randy. Um, as you clearly said, yeah, people signed up to do things which they didn't know what they were signing up for and things that had never been done before. I really enjoy that, and I'm sure I'll use that quote many times. Now, Richard Grisanthavai from ARM is here. Uh, so please go ahead. He is Senior Vice President and Chief Architect and Fellow at ARM, um, Cambridge, UK. Richard, please go ahead with your ARM um, story. And for the audience, I asked all the authors to, if possible, read a paragraph or make remarks. So some authors will be reading paragraphs from the articles and some authors will be paraphrasing or making remarks. Richard, please go ahead. Uh, so this is from my article, the introduction to it, um, the milestones that define ARM's past, present and future. Much has been written of ARM's inception. Sophie Wilson and Steve Ferber's original Acorn Risk Machine and the ARM-1 microarchitecture in 1985, the restructuring into Advanced Risk Machines Limited in 1990 that saw Acorn Computers, Apple and VLSI invest together to advance this new architecture. How a small team of engineers working out of an 18th century turkey barn outside of Cambridge, England, went on to create a business that, 30 years on, is considered a vital contributor to the global technology ecosystem. Given unlimited column inches, ARM1 might have been a fine place to start. Yet when I look back over 30 years of groundbreaking innovation, architectural improvements and revolutionary devices, a select number of true breakthroughs in ARM's history stand out to me. And out of those, none is more pivotal, pivotal to the arm we know today as a decision made in desperation on a train out of Kyoto in 1994. And the article goes on to talk about the thumb um, instruction set. Thank you, Richard. Now, David Christie, AMD Senior Fellow, and co-architect of AMD 64 ISA will present a part of the AMD story now. Thank you, Lizzie. I'll read a paragraph from a time close to the start of our journey and Mike Clark will follow up with where it's taken us. K5 was a huge bet for AMD. And in fact, there was at first some hedging of it. For the first few months, a parallel path was explored, similarly leveraging the 29K Jaguar design, but for PowerPC. As the viability of K5 became more apparent, and with x86 looking like the more profitable path, the PowerPC effort was dropped. In the end, the results of K5 were mixed. The learning curve of our first x86 design was certainly a big factor. <clears throat> to address that, AMD had invested heavily in hardware emulation to accelerate pre-silicon learning. And although this resulted in first silicon booting Windows 3.1 on day one, just three years after the project started, it was only then that the team could even begin testing the ocean of x86 software, uncovering obscure bugs and discovering what really mattered for performance and compatibility. Mike. AMD now has leadership products spanning high-end laptops to the hearts of the largest cloud and enterprise data centers, and is on track to power the nation's first exascale supercomputer, the Frontier System, at Oak Ridge National Labs with AMD Epic CPUs and AMD Instinct Accelerators. Looking back, the contrast between today's SOC SIP projects and K5 is mind-boggling, not just in terms of the absolute size of the design, but also in the roughly tenfold increase in resources applied to each project. This increase reflects not just more complex core designs, and the wealth of system logic around them. But more importantly, it's a result of the knowledge AMD has accumulated on what it really does take to do the job right. The people, the tools, methodologies, organization, and skills across all engineering disciplines that give the predictability of execution on which our customers bet their businesses. 
And thank you, Lizzie, for all your hard work putting this together. Thank you, David and Mike. Mike, I cannot resist to make this comment. Mike is a student of mine, I, and he has taken four classes from me and wrote his master's uh, uh, thesis with me. Th uh, nice to see you here, and thanks, David and Mike. Now, let's listen to Pradeep Bose, Distinguished Research Staff Member and IEEE Fellow from IBM Research. Uh, th thank you, Lizzie. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for organizing this memorable event. Uh, it's a distinct privilege and an honor to be able to speak at this August forum. Uh, so in, this, in the minute or so allotted to me, let me uh, introduce myself. I'm Pradeep Bose. Um, and I'm just a humble member of a galaxy of stalwarts that helped launch the IBM power family of risk superscalar processors in the mid to late 1980s. So in the article that, uh, that, that you will find in this special issue, um, I have basically given a shout out to those stalwarts and those talented engineers who on a day-to-day -day basis uh, uh, struggle with pre-silicon modeling of various flavors. Uh, when uh, we started this mission in the late, in the mid 1980s, at IBM Research, uh, developing the first superscalar risk uh, microarchitecture. Uh, and the models, the, the architecture was microarchitecture was really simple and things have gone really, really complex. And it's not just about performance, it's about performance, it's about power, it's about reliability. It's a multidimensional optimization problem. But these modelers, and I was one of the uh, pioneers, uh, we are integral part of the microarchitecture definition team. And so um, in, in a, just a brief kind of excerpt from one of the reading from the article, I wanted to stress uh, the art or science of performance validation. That is, how do you validate these pre-silicon performance models um, when, when they're being used to define uh, the next generation microprocessor? Uh, so uh, in a, I just read a couple of sentences. In an era where high, highly parameterized modular simulators were developed for use in defining a family of power PC microprocessors in an almost concurrent manner, the challenge of maintaining modularity and easy configurability while ensuring acceptable levels of accuracy soon became very evident. I'll leave it at that, you can read. Uh, and see some of the early work that we had to do um, in trying to propose a framework through which you, one could validate uh, the performance numbers that were coming out from simulators uh, before, long before there was RTL. So I'll leave that as a teaser and uh, let me pause here. Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep. Now, Steve Keckler, Vice President at NVIDIA and Fellow of IEEE and ACM will tell us the story of GPUs. Thank you very much, Lizzie. Um, I'm Steve Keckler. I'm the Vice President of Architectural Research at NVIDIA. To me, the GPU was the first truly massively parallel microprocessor. The first GPU, the GeForce 256 in 1999, combined vertex and fragma computations for graphics on the same chip and was programmed by configuring fixed function hardware blocks. The G80 in 2006 was the first CUDA programmable GPU targeting both graphics and scientific computing applications. Recent innovations such as tensor cores, low precision arithmetic, and support for structured sparsity have enabled GPUs to skirt the slowing of Moore's law scaling and to continue to provide generous end application improvements with each generation. Today's GPUs are technological marvels with NVIDIA's Ampere products packing, uh, packing in 20 teraflops of compute performance and two terabytes of bandwidth uh, into a single chip and incorporating features to facilitate multi-GPU scale up and scale out. The history of GPU computing is marked by multiple virtuous technological com technology confluences, including the overlap in com computation requirements between computing and consumer graphics uh, that in led, led to GPU computing in the first place. 
And more recently, the simultaneous, simultaneous availability of massive data sources and the computation power to process them, which has driven the rise of deep learning. On behalf of the many thousands of NVIDIA hardware and software engineers who've contributed to GPU technologies, we look forward to future GPU evolution that will continue to scale compute and memory capabilities and expand to further support new application areas, system scalability, and programmability. Thank you. And thank you, Lizzie, for all of your support uh, for creating this, uh, this, this wonderful edition. Thank you, Steve. Now, Bob Carwell, formerly of Intel and DARPA and chief architect of Pentium, will talk about the origin of Intel MicroOps. Thanks, Lizzie. <clears throat> um, you know how to throw a party. It, it's, this is kind of <laughs> cool seeing all these people up all at the same time. Um, so when, when Lizzie approached me for uh, possibly contributing to this, uh, I had just read an, yet another article that said that somehow the micro-op uh, design of this, that's the basis for Intel's x86s was somehow risk-like or risk-inspired or based on converting CISC instructions into risk instructions. There were a lot of those. Um, I think my, from my point of view, there's three separate mistakes built into that when, you, when people say that. And, and I think if you're going to make three mistakes, making them concurrently is probably the most efficient way to do it. But my advice would be don't make the mistakes. So the first one is this, that, that this attitude is factually and historically incorrect. Um, I can tell you that as a matter of fact. We, we came at the micro-op idea from a data flow point of view. It had nothing to do with risk. We were thinking about if all you had to do was obey true data dependencies, how fast could you go? And can you make a machine like that? And of course, you know who came up with that stuff first and asked those questions. It was Jack Dennis and Arvind and people like that. And we also noticed uh, some of us had come from uh, multi-flow and done VLIWs, and we were very aware of what data flow, uh, uh, data dependencies meant and how to handle them. So that's the first error. The second error is that it conflates, that attitude conflates microarchitecture with instruction set architecture. And you, can, you should never do that. And, and, or if you do do that, do it intentionally um, on a specific you know, one thing at a time basis. Don't do it across the board without thinking about it. Uh, if, if, if people learn nothing from Intel's success over the last 50 years, it should have driven home the idea that these two topics are different. And if it comes right down to it, microarchitecture is economically a lot more important than an ISA is on, its, on a chip by chip basis, not across this broad sweep of things. So, even successful ISIS that forced their owners to keep re-implementing them, which is one way to look at what AMD and Intel do. Uh, and it carries along an accumulation of warts as you go, it gets harder. Anyway, splitting those two is really important and keeping them separate. And the third error is, I believe, is the people seem to lack a clear idea of what risk really means. If you look at what a micro-op is in Intel's case, uh, they're wide. They're more than 100 bits wide. They carry all sorts of information about renamed registers, dependencies, program order, uh, internal housekeeping that only has to do with the, with the guts of the machine and nothing to do with the instruction set. And the compiler can't target them. The compiler cannot reach the micro-ops. It can't generate them. It can't say, please do it this way. All of that stuff is antithetical to what the basic idea was in the first place of what RISC was trying to do. So... Uh, if whatever advances you might attribute to risk concepts, adding a wall between the microcode and the software cannot possibly be among them. So, uh, so those are the three conceptual errors, I think. And, and, the, and the, the, the last observation I would make is this idea that we had in 1990 to convert x86 instructions into micro ops has basically stood the test of time because Intel's still doing it. Uh, they, it's, it solved a fundamental instruction decoding problem while providing a unified way to implement microcode. So Intel's still using this uh, in its most recent designs 30 years later. I, I, I'm pretty proud of that. I think that's a cool thing. It's not, it's not that common that you can see something last that long, uh, a mechanism buried that deeply inside of a machine. Uh, thanks Lizzie for the opportunity to, uh, to expostulate on this topic. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, for writing the article as well as coming here. As Bob's passionate words showed, the debates in microprocessors are, are, are we are far from done. And so maybe you know, after today's when this meeting ends, 
those of one those of you who want to stay can stay and we can argue and debate for some more time on the risk and the cisc you know um anyway let's move on now let's listen to vanda gas from texas instruments who will talk about some early dsp processors and in case she doesn't show the julie doll i would say you do not want to miss her article where she has a doll that the speech recognition from the 1980s so wanda please thank you lizzie and thanks for including me in this amazing release um issue of micro it's been amazing to read all the articles there in the 1970s texas instruments was an early player in the microprocessor industry its processors were included in consumer products like calculators digital watches, and the 4-bit microcontroller enabled digital games for children, like Simon says. And it became the basis for the first generation digital signal processor by Texas Instruments. TI's DSP chip contained the processor, on-chip memory, and input-output signals to interface to the external events. The processor used a Harvard architecture where the program address space and the data address space were in separate areas. But the Julie doll was one of the early commercial products based on TICSP. Sold in 1987, Julie was the first toy capable of speech recognition. Thanks, Lizzie. Thank you, Vanda. Now, Ray Simar, currently at Rice University, but previously of Texas Instruments, will talk about the successful VLIW DSP processors from Texas Instruments. Hey, Lizzie, thanks a lot for this opportunity. Um, and I'm also joined by Reed Taji, who led the compiler effort uh, when we went off and did our VLIW work. What I thought we would do is discuss a bit more about some of the interesting decisions that were made, not just in the architecture, but also in terms of the people and the teams, because you can always go to the paper and kind of get more detail. Um, what's interesting is when we finally made the decision to try to build a VLIW microprocessor for DSP, Josh Fisher, uh, we had reference to Multiflow earlier, had, all that had happened more than 10 years earlier. But with the progress of Moore's law that Pat mentioned earlier, we could take the VLSI designs that were these huge multi-board bit slice um, computers and crush it all down and finally implement in a microprocessor. Uh, so Moore's law was huge. The, the advancement of Moore's law was huge in enabling that. But another thing that was really interesting is how we decided to kind of put together the team to do it. What we did is we put together a really small, um, literally about a dozen people, multidisciplinary team. We had application engineers. We had compiler experts like Reed, who's here with us today. Um, we had expert designers. We had new designers. And we had people that had architecture. And what that team did is we went through lots of different alternatives. And one of the things I learned is you can take a small team of people, 12 people, and you can get them to change direction quickly. What's difficult is to take a team of 100 people and get them to change direction quickly. So having small teams that can kind of work through issues quickly were, were really important for us. And one of the things that was very critical we knew early on, and we could see this from like the multi-flow work that had been mentioned earlier, um, we had to have a great optimizing compiler. And we have a discussion of, of that uh, in our paper and how we had put that together. But the architectural evolution, we were going from some of the architectures that Wanda touched on earlier, um, or C3X, and then we went, eventually iterated and got to where we're going to do something that was more like a VLIW. It ended up being a perfect match for DSP algorithms. So you can get those details in the paper, but I think the question that we've got to start to begin to look at now is the future of DSP microprocessors. Semiconductor technology has moved a long way. And these are what it, for me is exciting now is to be looking at this, our history and then kind of looking going forward. And these are the problems at Rice and our new RVR lab that we're putting together is to look at these applications, benchmarks, architecture and compilers again. 
So thanks again, Lizzie. I appreciate the opportunity. Reed, please go ahead with your compiler story of the VLIW processors from TI. Looks like we have an audio issue. Um, how about we come back to you? Maybe we will. I will come back to you to see whether the audio can be fixed in the meantime. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Webcam on a Mac. Um, so I'm sorry about that. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I'll be brief. Um, when we started this whole effort uh, back in the early 90s, VLIW is not a popular choice. It hadn't been commercially successful. In, 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 and and um, one of the big concerns was, could you develop software for it? And so we spent a, a fairly large effort putting together a VLIW compiler. The thing that's gratifying about that is that those concepts, um, which were actually not new back then, but not commonly used, are still very relevant today, particularly for things like ML accelerators, right? And and we're, we're building these things still today um, using a lot of the same concepts we were building many years ago. The compiler industry still struggles with them. And, and, pro and a large part of that is modeling the microarchitecture, as Bob alluded to. Um, the nice thing about VLIWs is exposed, so we can at least get to it. And anyway, so it, it's it's it, it's been a really fun uh, six thousand architecture was really exciting thing to work on. Thank you, Reed. Now, Raghu Raghunathan, Motorola fellow, will present a story on Motorola microcontrollers. Raghu worked at Motorola in 80s and up to mid 90s. So Raghu also deserves some special mention here. He was the one who first asked me, are you doing a special issue for microprocessor at 50? Raghu. Okay, thanks for the opportunity, Lizzie. Uh, I wanted to call uh, the history of microcontrollers first 50 years starts at page 97. Uh, microcontrollers is a second cousin to microprocessors. Obvious with 30 plus people talking microprocessors, a handful of microcontrollers, but the numbers show a different story. Shipping nearly a quarter trillion with the T, micros by now, there are mostly MCUs and embedded processors. It proves it's no wonder MCUs are ubiquitous and high performance autonomous driving vehicles all the way down to tiny IoT devices which are cost sensitive. So we're really looking at what the market needs. Motorola designed its first CMOS processor for portable communications. It was the 19, late 1970s, a two volt with milliamps and microamps of power with a weight and stop instruction, which Motorola introduced. It was the beginning of the voltage and power scaling that's still used in CMOS technology. PA, Intel, Motorola, uh, Japan, and Europe all contributed to the MCU integration. You can see in the figure three in the article. And as an example, figure two, 68HCL, which I happened to lead, uh, had a CPU, a timer, a serial interface, a WPROM, analog, and a NAND ROM, believe me, in 1984. This product propelled Motorola as a leader in automotive application. Uh, Toshiba invented the flash WPROM, and we had a custom called intermodule bus that made a core independent plug and play. I think somebody mentioned about it, I think NVIDIA. That allowed us to integrate chips very quickly and dominate the market. Uh, for that one, you should probably read the Mark McDermott's article on SOC. <laughs> then, uh, this is the power PC based uh, embedded controller, which is probably the largest selling embedded controller used by Bosch, Siemens, Ford, GM, Chrysler, and the other people. But entry of warm architecture changed the landscape. With nearly 500 licenses, the low power MCUs 
embedded processor combined with low cost software comp compatibility propelled ARM to be a de facto standard. Then the risk five, right? It delivers, they say, it delivers a new level of free extensible software and hardware freedom and architecture, paving the way for the next 50 years of computing design and innovation. Hopefully, MCUs will reach the first trillion mark long before 50 years. Don't let to wait for another 50. Long live the single chip solution, whether you call it a MCU, embedded processor, or SOC. Thank you, Lizzie. Thanks, Raghu. And Murray Goldman will join now. They work together in Motorola in the 70s, 80s. So Murray was general manager of the Motorola microprocessor groups from 70s to the 90s. And he will talk on the drama around the Motorola 68,000. Hi, can you, can you hear me, Lizzie? Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, thanks for the invite. I was just gonna try to in two minutes tell the Mo Motorola microprocessor story. And uh, started in the mid 1975, we had a very good product. We couldn't manufacture very well. So we were late to market. And we, when we finally finished that, fixed that, our customers were gone. So we were worried about our survival and along came General Motors, which became a huge customer with 6 million cars a year. And, and it enabled us to fund everything that followed. It was a catalyst. So from that, we did, we got very, very strong in embedded control system on a chip. Hello. Kind of things that. Yes, hi. Um, that Ragu just talked about. And we, I think I'm getting uh, interference or something. I don't know. And we went after the computer market with the 68,000 chip where we got very aggressive on process technology. We came out with the 68,000 in 1979. In our eyes, it was well ahead of the industry. We created the desktop market with customers like HP and NCR and Sony and startup companies like Sun Microsystems and Apollo and later Apple Computer. And basically that's the microprocessor story at Motorola. And we went on to make higher performance versions of that later in life. And thank you for the invitation. It's a real, joy listening to all these other speakers today. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Murray. Now, Timothy Pinkston, George Flieger Chair Professor at University of Southern California with his piece. Timothy. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon. Um, pleased to be uh, a part of this uh, um, celebration. Uh, the integration of a fully functional router on the Alpha 21364, the EV7 microprocessor chip for supporting high performance, scalable and reliable communication in NUMA based multiprocessor systems was really cool. And in many ways, precedent setting. The EV7 network architecture was remarkably robust and cutting edge, scalable to up to 128 processor configurations. It, fe uh, it featured uh, competitively low latency pin-to-pin -pin, and high bandwidth peak and sustained packet transport, both of which were superior to contemporaneous off-chip routers. It did so with a fully uh, pipeline router implementation that allowed the router to operate at, a proce at the processor's uh, cores, uh, clock speed and with virtual cut-through adaptive routing um, along mental paths of a 2D torus network topology that allowed bypassing of network hotspots and congestion mitigation. It provided support for directory-based cache coherence and network deadlock avoidance by implementing separate virtual channels for different coherence protocol packet classes 
and its routing algorithm logical networks. It also provided reliability and fault tolerance support with SecDead error recovery and first hop misrouting to circumvent error prone or broken uh, interconnection network links. As one of the first, if not the first, uh, microprocessor designs to integrate a fully functional on-chip router, the EV7 helped to usher in the era of on-chip networks, also known as networks on chips or NOCs, for supporting efficient data movement in multi-core, mini-core processor chips that soon followed and now are prevalent across diverse computing systems. Again, thank you, Lizzie, for allowing me the opportunity to participate in the celebration. Thank you, Tim. Now, John Mashey, formerly of MIPS and co-founder of the SPEC Performance Evaluation Corporation, he will speak now. John. John Mashey, I see you in participants. I... John, if you are here, please unmute and speak. Okay, I will check with you later. Um, now let's listen to Kunle, Cadence Design Systems Professor at Stanford. Um, Kunle, if you are here, please unmute and speak. Okay. Um, John Mashi. Um, there are many authors who couldn't be here and who, you know, if Glenn Henry or Simon Segar, oh, John, finally, you can, yeah, go ahead and please speak. Oh, okay, sorry, I just had to go to get something to drink, yeah. Uh, uh, so just a couple words. I, I figured when I was writing my article that, you know, given the set of authors, a lot of good history would be covered, and that's why I couldn't resist uh, basically talking about some of the weird software hardware interactions that led us to where we are and a lot of odd accidents. Um, I mean, after all, Unix easily couldn't, might not have happened. Uh, uh, Ken Thompson never would have been working at Bell Labs except for the incredible pers persistence of a recruiter who chased him for a week and <laughs> uh, finally got him to take a, a, an interview at, uh, at the labs. Uh, had... Uh, had the computer science research group had a little more budget, they would have gotten the PDP-10 instead of um, the PDP-11s, and the world might have looked a lot different. So I, I just found looking back at history, there, you know, there was in some sense relatively little inevitability of some of the things that happened, and that's why I couldn't resist um, uh, writing about those. Thank you, John, so for interactions and many of the unspoken interactions, please read John's article. Now, um, we will go to, uh, Kunle, are you here? Uh, we will go to some videos and I'll check back with the remaining authors after the videos. So 11 of the authors have sent us videos and in the interest of time, those videos were cut short. So you should go and read their articles, but this is just to give a short glimpse of what they wrote about. So we will go to watch the videos now. Hi, I'm Ravi Ayer from Intel Labs. It's great to be here to celebrate microprocessors at 50 with IEEE Micro's special issue. We had the opportunity to provide an article on advances in microprocessor cache architectures over the last 25 years. I'll just read a little bit of that paper so that it's clear what we are talking about there. Over the last 25 years, the use of caches has significantly advanced in mainstream microprocessors to address the memory wall challenge. As we transformed microprocessors from single core to multi-core to many core, Innovations in the architecture, design, and management of on-die cache hierarchy were critical to enable scaling in performance and efficiency. In addition, at the system level, as I.O. devices, especially networking, and accelerators started to interact with general purpose cores across the shared memory hierarchy, 
Advancement in caching became important as a way of minimizing data movement and enabling faster communication. So in this article, we cover some of the major advancements in cache research and development that have improved the performance and efficiency of microprocessor servers over the last 25 years. We reflect upon several techniques, including shared and distributed last level caches, cache quality of service to address interference, direct cache access to place IO data directly into CPU caches, and also extending caching to off-die accelerators using the Compute Express links capability of CXL.cache. We also outline potential future directions for cache research and development over the next 25 years. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Pete Harrod from Arm in Cambridge, and I was very pleased to be able to write a short article for the special issue of IEEE Micro. And my article is entitled Memories from IBM 370 to ARM. And I'm just going to read a short extract from it. My entire career has been closely tied up with the microprocessor. And this 50th anniversary has given me cause to think back and celebrate how far it's come. My first exposure to a computer was in 1973 at Bits University, writing Fortran programs on punch cards and running them on an IBM 370 mainframe. But by the time I got to my final year in 1976, the electrical engineering department had purchased an Intel 8080 development board, and we designed and built a digital three-term motor controller based upon that board, demonstrating the advantage of being able to easily change the controller's behavior through changes to the software. That project was the start of a fascinating journey. Rolled on a few years, and I then became one of the founding team of ARM when it was spun off from Acorn Computers to develop the ARM 610 processor that powered the Apple Newton. This, the ARM processor was small and low power, and this made it ideal for embedded applications, including in the mobile phone, which everyone in the world eventually wanted. And in the over 30 years of my career at ARM, I've contributed to developing power efficient products for many different markets, and witnessed the microprocessor become ubiquitous. For example, more than 200 billion ARM-based chips have now been shipped by ARM's partners. I feel privileged to have played a small part in the microprocessor story. It's the technology that's truly changed the world. Impressive increase in single chip processing power since the Intel 4004 was launched in 1971. But die size improvements have not kept pace with other advancements. There are practical limits to increasing die size simply by increasing the reticle size. That is the largest area of the wafer that can be patterned in one go using a lithography stepper system. As a result, in the last two decades, die size has doubled where previously it was doubling every three to five years. The cadence of geometry shrinks is also slowing down. The result is a dramatic slowing of the increase in the number of transistors available to implement a processor. Clearly, one way to make the most powerful processor possible is to use the entire wafer to make a single chip. In addition to increasing the transistor count, the larger die greatly reduces the time and energy required to communicate between functional units. The Cerebris wafer scale engine first introduced in 2019 successfully overcame both the lithography, yield, and packaging challenges that doomed early attempts at wafer scale integration. While the journey to the first commercial wafer scale product has not been an easy one, the result is immensely satisfying. Our solution is delivering transformative performance and value to customers around the world. The Cerebra Systems team is proud to have built a piece of microprocessor history. As heterogeneous SOCs keep growing in complexity, the cost associated with different aspects of their design is rapidly increasing. Design cost became a critical problem, giving rise to a new research area that builds upon lessons learned from the software industry, agile hardware development. As John Hennessy and David Patterson emphasized during their 2017 Turing Award lecture, as the focus of innovation in architecture shifts from the general purpose CPU to domain specific and heterogeneous processors, we will need to achieve major breakthroughs in design time and cost. 
the development of bio-inspired technology has evolved from exclusively silicon-based neuromorphic chips, such as IBM True North and Intel Loihi, to heterogeneous design prototypes, termed as wetware, where live stem cells are integrated with silicon-based electronic components. The Conicore prototype by Conico Incorporated combines biological receptors on a silicon chip and has been demonstrated to have widespread applications from detection of chemicals, explosives, and even in testing for COVID-19. Good afternoon. As microprocessors were becoming popular, a well-known computer was Digital Equipment Corporation's VAX 11780. That system defined performance of 1.0 for the original spec mark, which means that this result from 1989 showed that a single chip system was already performing at 11 times the power of the original VAX. Can we get some estimate of a contemporary chip using that same metric? Well, I ported the benchmarks to a contemporary version of GCC and came up with the 17,000 that you see on this slide. That's exercising only one core though. If we exercise all 36 cores on a two-chip system, the number is rather higher. Anyway, back to the question, how many vaxes can you fit in the palms of your hands? Well, if you're holding one contemporary Xeon 6354 in each palm, it looks to me like you hold the processing power of over 400,000 vaxes. Thank you. Hi, this is Bob Martin, Senior Staff Engineer for Microchip, and I want to thank the IEEE for giving me the honor to be part of the 50th anniversary edition. It's come a long way, and we're all really excited about what the next 50 years is going to bring. Now I'm going to read the first couple paragraphs of my article uh, in the 50th anniversary edition. The current frenzy to connect everything to the cloud, from blenders to toothbrushes, and everything in between. The Internet of Things world is dominated by low-cost integrated 32-bit microcontroller radio frequency RF modules that provide compact footprint solutions for a low number of sensor inputs. The communication stacks for Wi-Fi, narrowband, and BIoT, and Bluetooth are well suited for the 32-bone domain, along with the increasing computational power to keep the RF channels secure. However, as the number of sensor channels increases, or lower power consumption required by more locations increase system design complexity, adding an additional 8-bit microcontroller unit can add values in the ways as shown as figure one. Hey, I'm Cliff. Thanks to Lizzie for organizing both the special issue and the celebration of it. My favorite microprocessor was, perhaps unsurprisingly, a special purpose chip. Antic drove the display of my Atari 400, which debuted in 1979. I can't find transistor counts, but Antic probably had a few thousand transistors like its host 6502. It lived on the processor daughter board along with the 6502 and a suite of other display and sound chips. Antic ran a single loop program at 60 Hertz, matching the refresh rate of NTSC televisions. Each instruction described how to draw one to 16 scan lines on my TV with a variety of bit mapped and character map modes. An Antic program was called a display list Enterprising programmers could mix text and graphics vertically down the screen with the goal of conserving the machine's precious 16 to 48 kilobytes of RAM. There were rudimentary sprites, but the coolest feature was the display list interrupt, which interrupted the main 6502 CPU. With just the right interrupt code in the CPU, I could change the color or character maps while the TV's electron gun was resetting from right to left or bottom to top. Building increasingly sophisticated graphics for games was a gateway drug for me, where each new idea of misusing my Atari's graphics hardware pulled me deeper into the tiny world inside of my computer. Happy birthday. This is the Kenairu Maynard, and I am so honored to share my computer journey to celebrate the microprocessor at 50. I didn't realize how old I was until I was asked to reflect on this question. Growing up without a computer, my journey began in college where I fell in love with every computer I met. 
At Brooklyn Poly, I was fortunate that my engineering school not only had what was current, but also gave me the opportunity to touch history. How efficient it was to do my homework on the train to Brooklyn, shuffling punch cards in their final order so I could turn them into the IBM mainframe when I arrived. But nothing was as fascinating as programming in assembly language by flipping the levers of the PDP-11. My graduate school years at Carnegie Mellon gave my love for soldering an opportunity to build a bit slice microprocessor. But true love bloomed when my master's thesis introduced me to a world of fault tolerant avionic systems and the triple modular redundancy that kept airplanes flying. Post-doctorate, I rose to the ranks of Trace Queen at IBM Research, owner and caretaker of a refrigerator-sized system that housed address traces shared with many that fed my research on improving performance of commercial systems. Today, my favorite computer fits in the palm of my hands. My smartphone is my everything, my computer tool, my to-do list, document editor, alarm clock, exercise tracker, and diary, and today, filming this video. I'm from AGH University, Krakow, Poland. In my student days, my favorite central processing unit was NICV20. The first news about it was brief laconic, then more and more information appeared which was more and more interesting. The NIC20 had 63,000 transistors, while the Inter 8088 CPU had 29,000 transistors, with over twice as many transistors when you can build more sophisticated hardware. I found it fascinating. I liked this microprocessor because it had many useful features. I liked the good extended instruction set increased efficiency and new CPU modes. I also like the standby mode. After phrasing, the CPU consumes a trace amount of power without the use of very complicated circuits. I first began programming computers with SORT M23P in 1985 as an undergraduate student. I then moved to the field and worked with the mainframe computer, which was based on a ZAD. In 1990, I developed a software simulation that could run the ZAD assembly language instructions and display register contents on an IBM PC. None of these would have been possible without the incredibly brave decision that Fagin, Shima, and Angerman made to depart from Intel and form their own company, Zilog. While not having a foundry, financial sponsor, and a large team to work with. The microprocessor that they were able to create became one of the leading microprocessors of its generation, propelling the industry forward and creating a lasting impact on the computer industry. Furthermore, the incredible market competition created by Zilog and Intel helped advance the development of microprocessors. The z data microprocessor initially took the industry by storm. And although it feels like it has disappeared in the recent times, it still lives in a variety of markets as one of the longest living microprocessors of all time. At this time, I would like to see, are there any authors I missed who was going to speak? If I made an error, I did not call your name. Please unmute and speak right now. And I believe Simon Seekers is not here. If Simon, you are here, please speak also. Okay. So uh, in addition to the various articles, when six months ago, we ran a public opinion poll on what's your favorite microprocessor. And uh, 200, uh, 250, more than 250 people participated and Associate Editor-in-Chief Vijay Krishnan Narayanan from Penn State is going to present the results of the poll.
Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, again joining in this uh, incredible event. Uh, however, uh, uh, such an event needs celebration of the entire community. And the editor's poll is really a reflection of our community picking their best wins. Uh, there are uh, surprises and uh, celebrations for even people attending today. Uh, 1970s, uh, the winner was the 8086. Uh, sorry, Frederico, it was not the 4004, but it was the people's choice. Uh, and uh, if Pat, you are still around, here is another uh, cheer for you. The uh, people's choice for the 1980s was 8486. Hooray. <laughs> and then uh, for the 1990s, uh, uh, it's Pentium and uh, 2000. It was again uh, uh, Intel Core. So Pat continues celebrating. Uh, uh, but 2010, uh, Mark, uh, uh, a paper master, and others at AMD, you can join in in the celebration. AMD Zen uh, uh, came in. Yay. Uh, uh, All-time uh, right. favorite uh, was another surprise to us. It was not a winner in any of the decades. Uh, it happened to be uh, the deck alpha. And one important thing uh, from this poll, it's not how much of a pie each company got, but how the pie grew with all of us coming together as a community. Uh, uh, beyond uh, just what each one had. At 50 years, the microprocessor arena is still hot and competition is vigorous. Many more interesting architectures and chips are certain to appear in the coming decades. Maybe at the Platinum Jubilee or the Centenary, we are sure these teenager and middle-aged processors that won these early decades will still show some excitement uh, then. Thanks again. And uh, I would try to recognize uh, uh, Professor Lissy John for having uh, put her heart and soul into this issue. And I hand it back to her. Thank you. Thanks, Vijay. And you want to read the full article to see in each decade the number two very interesting processors and alpha was a number two in its decade, but in the overall all time winner, it came as the number one. So it's an interesting article that summarizes people's thoughts on all these amazing processors. So I would say each one of them was a fantastic processor. Um, now, let me thank Pat Gelsinger, all of the speakers, all the industry leaders who came here and sent videos, all those who wrote in the article and sent memories, all guests who attended today. Thank you, all of you. And as you saw, we had participation from many countries and continents. And I would also thank Associate Editor-in-Chief Vijay for helping me with many tasks as we went. The articles were coordinated by us, and I want to thank all the authors who submitted articles and perspectives and went through iterations of revisions. The IEEE staff also deserve special mention. Joanna Gojlik, I don't know whether Joanna is here. Joanna, if you are here, I sincerely appreciate the patience with which you dealt with all the issues that surfaced during the compilation of this issue. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. In Rachel. addition to Joanna, Joanna, um, Joanna, you want to say something? No, I just wanted to thank you. It was, it's a pleasure to work with you. Yeah. And the, because of the ad hoc nature or it's once in a lifetime kind of thing, I needed advice, guidance on many issues and Kimberly Sperka, Robin Baldwin, Carrie Clark, Heather McCallin, Christine Anthony, and Diane Burton at IEEE. Your assistance and advice are truly appreciated. Now, no celebration of the microprocessor becomes complete without acknowledging the contributions 
of the family members of all the people who worked on these amazing processors. Fajin, he writes in his autobiography, Silicon, page 68, he says, extremely busy, I was mostly absent from my family life and could not give Elvia much support in taking care of our newborn daughter. Fortunately, her sister gave her a helping hand. I am sure there are many such stories in all these families. IEEE acknowledges and appreciates the support given by Elvia and other wives, husbands, children, parents, brothers, sisters of all the microprocessor designers and architects of these past five decades. So I would like to give you know, an applause to the tremendous support the family members showed so that these designers and architects could work on these amazing products. Now, the various articles illustrate how intertwined personal lives and professional careers of those who worked on these microprocessors were through these years. As Randy Stack says in his article, visionaries and engineers repeatedly signed up to do what has not been done before. The enthusiasm, the passion, quite admirable. Let's continue this trend. Hope this issue and the saga of the microprocessor stays alive forever, serving humanity in ways unimaginable. Thank you all for participating and bye. Please read the issue for all the articles. They are all very encouraging. Thanks again, Lizzie. It was awesome. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, Lizzie. Really good, Lizzie.